Discharge Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if it's true. We should always do your own homework and let us know when we're ready. Welcome back to The Curbsiders, the internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice-changing knowledge. I'm Dr. Shreya Trivedi, here with my incredible co-host, Dr. Leah Witt, and the Dr. Chris, the Chris the Chew Man Chew. That's me. I think I said too many Chris's yeah. there. Or Chew, Chris, I don't know. Chris, I said Chris, Chris the Chew. <laughs> I was just... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Leah, why don't oh, you? I need a nickname. Yeah. Oh, hmm. L W. The wit. Yeah. The wit is a awesome. witch. Yeah. The witch. <laughs> All right. So this is the third episode of our Women in Medicine series. Last August, we uh, talked to Dr. Vinny Arora about the paucity of women in leadership positions and how we could find sponsors for career advancement and also be bold about our career decisions. And then in December, we spoke to Dr. Susan Hingle about work-life integration. We're still figuring it out, but she gave us some advice. She said, stop worrying about what other people think. Acknowledge that being a doctor is hard, especially for women due to disproportionate out of work responsibilities and define a beautiful life that is individualized to you. Um, I'm still working on all of those things. Working on your kaleidoscope. Working on my kaleidoscope, my integration kaleidoscope. So today we're going to talk to Dr. Reshma Jagzi about sexual harassment in medicine and the Me Too and Time's Up movements across science and the medical fields. So we'll be unpacking the definition of sexual harassment and how we can all recognize and hopefully respond to harassment. Most importantly, she describes the systemic and cultural changes that have to happen to affect real change. Yeah, we get to some real good, solid examples at the end that I think you guys Mm -hmm. will really enjoy. Uh, So who is Dr. Reshma Jagsi? Uh, She is uh, a Newman family professor, deputy chair and residency program director in the Department of Radiation Oncology and the director of the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine at the University of Michigan. Uh, She is the author of over 250 peer-reviewed publications in journals like The Lancet, New England Journal, and Harvard Business Review. Dr. Jagsey is both a breast cancer researcher as well as a social scientist who has led landmark studies regarding gender equity in academic medicine. She is also the one of the founding members of Times Up Healthcare and really paving the way to stamping out workplace harassment in medicine. All right, let's get into it. Hi, Rashma. Thanks for coming on the show. We're so excited to have you here. This is our, our third Women in Medicine episode. Thank you so much for including me. Yeah. And um, Dr. Jagsy, we usually go by first name uh, basis on the show. Is it okay with you if you call, we call you Reshma? Absolutely. And thanks for asking. All right. So let's get started with some rapid fire questions. Um, can you describe yourself in a one-liner? Uh, I am a physician and social scientist who tries to promote equity within the medical profession while also raising two awesome kids with a pretty awesome husband. Great one-liner. Um, I saw I saw on Twitter that one of your daughters just met Elizabeth Warren. Pretty amazing. One Isn't that husband. amazing? Yes, amazing. I'm so excited. Yes, it's. I, I'm well, going to have to come back to that over and over again during this. <laughs> not not just met, but inter- she was interviewing her. <laughs> That's yeah, what I noticed. yeah. Yeah, the question was, um, can you explain why there's still sexism today? It was great. And, and the response was great, too. So it's, it's awesome. Wow. Well, can you tell us your women in medicine moment of awakening and how you got into this line of research and advocacy? Absolutely. So um, my class in medical school was actually over half women. Um, Of course, that wasn't the case nationwide. Um, This was back in the 90s. But even nationwide, over 40% of medical students were women at that time. And I have to say that I really didn't think that much about gender equity. Um, I really actually thought that gender equity was a problem that my mom's generation had solved. Um, But then when I got to residency, my mentor, Dr. Nancy Tarbell, was the head of the Office of Women's Careers at MGH. And she really opened my eyes to just how few women were in senior positions in the field of medicine more generally. And she encouraged me, um, especially given my fairly unique mix of an MD 
and a doctorate in social policy to dedicate substantial scholarly effort towards understanding this issue. And so one of the first studies that I did in this area ended up being published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And right around that time, the AMA had started giving out a new grant that was called the Joan Giambalvo Scholarship. And Nancy said to me, you know, once you have a New England Journal paper, you're an expert. So you should totally apply for this grant. Ah. And so it was awesome. And so um, since that first study had actually raised more questions than answers um, for me, like why were women not reaching senior leadership Mm -hmm. positions? Was it a slow pipeline? Was there something else going on? And this was 2006. So Larry Summers had just made his infamous comments Mm -hmm. and it inspired me to start studying a group where Larry Summers himself couldn't argue that the women were less bright or less motivated to pursue research careers in academic medicine. And so that's how I started studying recipients of NIH K awards. So these are folks who succeeded in a competitive national application process for these career development awards. Um, They have substantial resources as a result of getting the awards and they have defined mentors and training plans. So they really should be expected to succeed, regardless of whether they're men or women. And so when my subsequent research, um, funded by that AMA grant that Nancy told me to go out and apply for, um, Mm. showed that women in this superstar population of K awardees weren't achieving independent R01 grants. You know, R01s are the hallmarks of becoming an independent investigator, which is sort of why you get a K award is to get an R01. Um, the women weren't achieving those R01s at the same rate as their male peers. And so to try to understand that further, I ended up applying for a bunch of other grants, um, which actually ended up leading to my own R01. Um, I think it was the most meta R01 ever (laughs) by NIH. The the NIH R01 on NIH R01 attainment. And so that then led to a bunch of other studies, and they include studies that show that even after you control for just about every potentially justifying factor ever raised for gender differences in compensation, including productivity metrics, the women are being paid less. And then, of course, the studies that you're interested in here for this podcast, the studies of sexual harassment that are experienced by women in medicine. The biggest mic drop ever. (laughs) Just... (laughs) <laughs> so many questions. Oh, goodness. Well, it's going to be hard to follow that one up. But my question for you is, what advice would you give your younger self about being a woman in medicine? It's a great question. Um, I actually stumbled fortuitously into doing some of the right things, um, but I guess it would have been better to have done them deliberately. Um, I think the, uh, the first piece of advice I would give is follow your heart. Um And I think I'm pretty programmed to be kind of a road not taken sort of person, um, the one who takes the path less traveled. You know, I'm I'm the kid of immigrants who fled an oppressive political regime. So I have a deep sense of commitment to social justice and political activism. Um, Again, super excited about the Twitter video where my daughter is like speaking with Elizabeth Warren. Um, But I did end up following my own heart. And I mention this just because there are a lot of those who say that the only path to success in academic medicine is like to find one molecule and study it for your entire career, um, which I wouldn't have loved doing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for those who say that you have to do that to be academically focused, my response is, well, it actually worked out just fine for me to do something that's a little atypical and pursue a couple of different avenues at the same time. I'm also a breast cancer researcher. And, you know, actually... I get inspiration to solve the breast cancer research questions when I'm studying gender equity, and I get inspiration to solve the gender equity issues when I'm studying breast cancer. And, you know, I think that's what's important in the end. And then another piece of advice um, that I would give in general, um, although again, I kind of did this, I just sort of, I I had really persuasive mentors, but the the advice would be listen to your mentors. Um, uh, My, again, my mentors were really persuasive, so anyone would have listened to them, but um, I think it's so incredibly important. Had had I not listened to Nancy, I never would have found this unique scholarly niche. Um, and then finally, I think one of the most important things, um, and one of the things that I would have gotten wrong if I hadn't listened to my mentors, um, is persevere. Because we all enter medical school being very accomplished, and most of us aren't really used to rejection. But in the end, I think it's how we deal with the inevitable rejections that occur in medicine and academic medicine in particular, and the resilience that we demonstrate that's so important. This is great advice. Thank you. I 
I really appreciate the advice that you don't have to be super hyper focused in order to succeed in academic medicine, because I think I hear that reiterated and I just feel like Mm -hmm. I have a few different interests, you know, I'd like to pursue a few different things. Yeah. Do what, do what brings you joy. Yeah. As a gen med fellow, it's just, I feel I've beat myself up almost on a daily basis for not being focused enough. Um, so I think everything, everything you said really resonates and we could probably spend a whole episode even just talking to you about your story about even, even hearing about the rejections. It's, mm-hmm. you know, really empowering for me to hear. Um, but our, our, our uh, we, we did want to also just before we get into the show, wanted to uh, ask you to tell us a little bit more about the Time's Up healthcare movement. Absolutely. Um, I would be delighted to talk to you about that because Time's Up Healthcare is a really wonderful and important organization um, that was founded to promote safe, equitable, and dignified environments for all women in healthcare. So that's not just physicians, but also nurses and other healthcare workers. And the idea is really to apply a classic healthcare quality improvement framework and encourage institutions to examine their structures, their processes, and their outcomes to create durable change. Amazing. Um, and how how can listeners get involved? And if it what would you like to kind of plug about the, that movement? Um, so one way to get involved with um, Time's Up Healthcare is actually to encourage your organization to become a signatory organization. Um, and when they sign up to become signatory organizations, um, they are pledging their commitment to the core statements of Time's Up Healthcare. So those include um, a commitment that sexual harassment and gender inequity have no place in the healthcare workplace. Um, we believe every employee should have equitable opportunity, support, and compensation. And finally, and this is, I I think, where individuals can be very important, um, we cannot address a problem without understanding its scope and impact. We will measure and track sexual harassment and gender-based inequities occurring in our institution. And so once you've convinced your leaders to become signatories, your leaders are committing to do this measurement. And what they need are reliable, trusted individuals within the organization who can help them with this important measurement activity. Because again, um, promoting equity is a healthcare quality improvement activity. It involves continuous innovation and evaluation. And so you we, you know, you need to bring your ideas to the table and your energy to the table to help that organization improve. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. I don't think I, I you know, I've, I've seen the website many times and I, I guess I didn't uh, like fully understand that that is what it takes to be a signature. And I, I have now so much more respect for those institutions where not just like, you know, putting lip service that we're committed to this, but like it means like they're actually doing the work. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's really great. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't we move on to picks of the week? Uh, Leah, what's your, what's your pick of the week? Yeah, my pick of the week, I had a different pick of the week, but then last night I was packing, listening to This American Life. And um, I listened to this episode called LaDonna. It is a replay of an episode they produced a year ago. And it was really timely because it's about a woman who is a security agent at an airport who is being repeatedly sexually harassed in a really, really horrifying ways. Uh, Everyone knows the repeat offenders. It's not a secret. Unfortunately, they're not being punished. And she's a pretty amazing woman. She's reading she's reading self-help books. She's reading Lean In. She's looking for anything that she can do to improve her situation. She becomes a manager and she signs herself up to train every security officer, retrain and retrain every security officer to try to change the culture of her organization. Ultimately, she sues her company (laughs) and many of the offenders do get fired and there is a culture change. But shockingly, the CEO is still not acknowledging that there was a problem, but really um, timely for, for our episode today. That's awesome. Chris, pick of the week. My pick of the week is a little lighter. Um, I watch a lot of YouTube, <laughs> and currently my one of my favorite channels is the Bon Appetit YouTube channel, and they just do lots of fun and creative things, and in their test kitchen, they have lots of great personalities, and what I like about cooking, I especially like baking and things like that, it's sort of like this strange like intersection between um, creation, art, and almost like a little science, because when, when you're looking at a test kitchen, they 
try out lots of different types of recipes and um, just serve. Yeah. So it, so that's my pick of the week is Bon Appetit YouTube channel. channel so <laughs> I think I'll go with my my pick of the week is The Nocturnist. It's a live, uh, live show and podcast uh, where doctors share their stories in medicine. It's hosted by uh, Dr. Emily Silverman, who is a fellow internist and uh, just a wonderful person. I've like reached out to her many times now and um, as friends, as women podcasters and just a supportive, like real deal person and um i wanted to give her a shout out and support her podcast i'd love to go to a live show one of these days yeah they were in the new york, they were in new york city and they did one on like death and dying stories uh in medicine uh unfortunately i forget where i was and i couldn't i couldn't make it um Rishma, do you have a pick of the week Oh my gosh, totally. I totally have to bring up again, my kid talking with Elizabeth <laughs> Warren on Twitter. So I just joined Twitter a week ago. So I've had a Twitter account for a couple of years because my center administrators told me I had to have a Twitter account because I had to be able to push out stuff about the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine via Twitter. Um, but I've never actually gone on Twitter um, before last Monday. And so within a week on Twitter, I end up getting this uh tweet, I guess they're called, um, showing <laughs> my kid in a video talking to Elizabeth Warren. And I'm looking there and I'm, I, and all I can say is, oh my gosh, that's my kid. And the question <laughs> she asked was so perfect. It was, you know, why is there, why is there still sexism today? And Elizabeth gives this incredibly cogent um, answer. First, she asks Serena, my daughter, what she thinks. And Serena says, well, I think men like to hang on to power. And <laughs> Elizabeth said, that's exactly what I was going to say, that I think it's about power. And she goes into a a great discussion about sexism and the need to be involved in government and democracy. And um, it's just about the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. And it's my kid. Yes. <laughs> that is so <laughs> cool. You have taught yeah. her well. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. She has my uh, heart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get started with our case. So today we're going to talk about two different cases to kind of frame our discussion. Um, and We'll be using our Curbsiders Woman in Medicine mascot, Dr. Beth Blackwell, but we were hoping, uh, Dr. Jagsy, that we could first talk about the definition of sexual harassment because it often seems pretty hard to define. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, there are both legal and social scientific definitions. And I will focus on the social scientific definition, although I'm happy to close with a little bit on the legal. Um, sexual harassment is defined by scholars um, as behavior that derogates, demeans, or humiliates an individual on the basis of that individual's sex. And so one of the most important contributions of the report from the National Academies, so you may be aware that last summer, the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine um, put out a report on sexual harassment. One of the big contributions to that report was that sexual harassment is actually made up of three categories of behaviors. And these three categories of behaviors can best be conceived of as an iceberg. And that's a metaphor that was initially conceived by a colleague of mine here at University of Michigan, um, Lilia Cortina. And it's a great metaphor because we tend mostly to focus on the tip of the iceberg, you know, that egregious quid pro quo, sleep with me or you're fired kind of thing, um, or the category of unwanted sexual advances. But there's a third category, gender harassment, that's actually the most com common, and it's the, it's the base of the iceberg underneath the surface, right? Right. And it turns out that gender harassment in three decades worth of organizational psychology studies has been shown to have profound effects on physical, psychological, and professional well-being of its targets. And so gender harassment includes things like offensive remarks about bodies, sexual insults, vulgar name-calling, and slurs. Now, all of these things can be legally prohibited by Title VII and Title IX. Um, where the law actually defines harassment as either being that quid pro quo kind of behavior or other behavior that, for example, explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with their work performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. But the behaviors have to be severe and pervasive enough to create that hostile work environment um, where so that behaviors that a social scientist would say absolutely meet the social scientific definition of sexual harassment still might fail to meet the legal definition. I 
really appreciate you clarifying that because um, one, to like help us all like before the episode starts, be on the same page about what we're talking about. Because I feel like I've heard many people either say like, wait a minute, did I just experience sexual harassment or did this person just experience it and kind of have questions about about it? Um, or there, I mean, uh, there are skeptics out there who, you know, don't believe that like, fi- you know, 50% of medical students have experienced sexual harassment and, you know, and, and I think question what it actually entails. So I think it was really, it's really powerful to hear you talk about this iceberg and kind of, it's not just the kind of the sleep with me overt, uh, very like, uh, advances, but it, there, there are things under the iceberg, uh, that also constitutes gender harassment. Yeah, we'll put a link to the National Academy's report in the show notes and, and a picture of the iceberg, which I think is really Perfect. powerful. Yeah. Excellent. All right, Chris, should we get started with our first case? Sure. So our first case is Dr. Wells is a second year resident with an interest in Hemonc. Dr. Blackwell is now a junior faculty member who is an advisor and mentor to Dr. Wells. Dr. Wells is finishing her Hemonc rotation and enjoyed working with her most recent attending, Dr. Malfoy, the division chair of the Hemonc department. Dr. Wells hopes that he will write a letter of recommendation for fellowship. At the end of their time on service, Dr. Wells asks Dr. Malfoy for feedback, and he invites her to an off-service dinner where he says he'd like to deliver feedback, he says, with other members of the team. Dr. Wells goes, but no other trainees attend. Dr. Malfoy spends the dinner talking about his open marriage and asking Dr. Wells personal questions about her prior partners. Dr. Wells finds a way to excuse herself out of the dinner early. Over the next week, Dr. Malfoy texts her repeatedly, inviting her to concerts and lunch, and discloses that he might be getting a divorce. She spoke to her co-residents. Several of them said, everyone knows Dr. Malfoy likes to flirt with female residents. Dr. Wells turns to you, Dr. Blackwell, her residency mentor for advice. She feels she needs a letter from Dr. Malfoy and is pressured to go to these events, but feels uncomfortable with his behaviors. I guess our big question is, is this sexual harassment? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think this is pretty clearly harassment. Um, and the fact that we even stop to ask that question probably speaks to some pretty serious underlying cultural issues we have within the medical profession as a whole. Um you know, social scientists have shown that the predictors of sexual harassment include hierarchical workplaces where women don't share equally in power and authority. And I think we're seeing that here. As in many places, the division chief, Dr. Malfoy, is a man, and he has the ability to make or break this woman's career, Dr. Wells. And she's really in a pretty awful position. She's probably actually already internalized some of the norms that we have in medicine, like one is supposed to suck it up and take a lot of crap during medical training, right? Mm -hmm. There's a great quote in the National Academy's report about medical training basically being a series of human rights violations such that when sexual harassment occurs, it actually doesn't seem that far removed from the other behaviors that we've been socialized to tolerate in the profession. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's a lot of what's going on here. But absolutely, this, this sounds like pretty clear sexual harassment. What should she do? Uh, What should she say? Yeah. So I think she's actually doing exactly the right thing here. She needs an ally and she's turning to Dr. Blackwell for support. Um, You know, a mentor like Dr. Blackwell in a senior position is optimally positioned to help remove her from the situation, um, mitigate the impact, support her, and then possibly also either confront the harasser, Dr. Malfoy, directly or facilitate reporting so that this doesn't happen to another young woman in the future. Now, it may be that what Dr. Blackwell ends up doing is offer to provide a letter of support and um, reach out to the employers at the institutions where she's seeking employment. And if Malfoy has a reputation, he might have a broader reputation, and she Mm -hmm. may be able to sort of say, there's a reason that the division chief didn't write a letter, but this is a truly outstanding um, resident, and you should consider her highly, or or fellow. Um, And so that's one thing that um, Dr. Blackwell can do. And then it's possible to delay reporting. So, you know, she might fear retaliation. So Dr. Wells might not want this formally reported right now. But on the other hand, um, it is critically important for us to be able to identify repeat offenders. And it sounds like Malfoy is one of these, you know, he's, you know, everybody's rolling their eyes. Well, he likes to flirt with the female residents. So 
who else has he done this to and who else is he going to do this to in the future? And so it's absolutely um, critical for us to view it as a duty of being part of this profession to ensure that there is reporting of this kind of behavior when it happens um, in a way that ideally minimizes its impact on the target of the harassment. And so again, having that ally involved who can step in maybe after the target has moved on um, and then bring up a report so that it's not really clear who was the reporter um, might be helpful. I think that's actually helpful because I've been in situations where I've really wanted to um, stand up for someone. And then I checked in with this person who experienced said harassment and, you know, they kind of said like, no, I don't want this attached to my name or I, I, or even like just plain, like Mm -hmm. I feel embarrassed or even like it's more of a, you know, uh, this is, we're talking about colleagues and supervisors, but even like patients where I had asked like, oh, do you want me to reassign the patient? And like, no, 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 no. It's okay. I work so hard to like Mm -hmm. treat this person uh, or this patient and, and, you know, it's, it's fine. I don't, I don't want that attached to me and, in the you know, and so, um, so I, yeah, I think it's helpful to to kind of to hear that you know you can wait uh, or you can kind of make it seem you don't have to do it in a way that points to this person uh, who was uh, experiencing it or yeah. And, and we need systems in place that facilitate that. So sometimes um, systems that uh, identify mandated reporters can actually. Um, complicate the situation. Um, but what what's really nice is when institutions provide, um, as organizational psychologists tell us they should, based on the evidence, um, a variety of different um, reporting processes, both formal and informal, um, protections of anonymity that are provided and sometimes contingently provided. So you can, if you use a certain platform, perhaps say, I would like to give you my information confidentially. Please don't contact me unless at least X other complaints are made against Mm. this same individual. And then I'm willing to come forward with more details. Um, There are ways to make the reporting process uh, more accessible. Having complaint handlers at every level of the organization so that they're not all mandated reporters, so that there are individuals who are peers that can be turned to. Um, It's very important for us to create a system where it's easier to identify allies and seek out the support one needs. I think the trouble is that a lot of our, I, I, I feel like a lot of people that I've talked to across the country don't know exactly how to report or what their policies are. How is their anonymity? And I don't know if there, I'm sure there's not just general advice to give everyone about look, look at this one page on your institution's website. Um, but. And again, it's not the responsibility of the individual woman, but this is why, uh, you know, if there's something that your listeners can do, it's to advocate that their organization sign on to an organization like Times Up Healthcare that's going to give them best practices. Because really what should be done is at the organizational level, there should be dissemination and enforcement of sexual harassment policy. Because it turns out that the literature shows that the lowest rates of sexual harassment occur in those organizations that proactively develop dissemination and enforce those policies. And so you're absolutely right. We do a terrible job of disseminating policies, but organizations have that responsibility. And that is a place where we can we can have system-wide quality improvement. I, I was really struck last week when we talked um, about this episode by something you said, which is that best pra- the best practice is to fix the system, not the woman. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, that it's simple, but very kind of mind mind blowing. When Shrey and I originally conceived of this episode, we thought like we need practical tips. This is happening in subtle and not so subtle ways to a lot of us very frequently. How are we handling the situation? And some of that maybe is needed, but really the problem is so much bigger than that. And it should, we should not be taking it all on our shoulders Mm -hmm. to fix it. Absolutely. Absolutely. A colleague of mine um, recently said, it's like if you had a a bunch of kids and you treat the situation and somebody can't drink their water because the kid next to them spat in their water and you tell the kid, well, you know, here's what you can do. You, you don't, you're not really that thirsty. You don't need to drink the water or, you know, there's not that many germs in spit. So like, just drink the water anyway, or stop being a wuss, just suck it up and drink the water. Uh, Or maybe don't irritate the kid next to you. And so they won't spit in your water the next time, right? There's all these Mm -hmm. things that we can say to the person whose water got spit into. Um, 
But what we need to start recognizing is it's not an individual person spitting into another person's glass. This is more like lead in the pipes that's poisoning the water. And mm-hmm. we need systems level interventions. And so um, I think that's a that's a really powerful metaphor for focusing on the system rather than the individual. And I think that um, uh, that is a really important approach. Uh, you already mentioned that there are some things about medical culture that perhaps make harassment a little bit more common. Um, is there any, can you give us some data or information on how pervasive this problem actually is? Yeah, absolutely. So I started studying sexual harassment just a few years ago, um, before the Me Too movement, um, before the presidential election. Um, we actually published a study from that R01 that I mentioned, the meta R01 of the K awardees. Um, they, uh, they actually were Generation X K awardees. And what we asked was a question that was asked previously in a 1995 study. And the rate of sexual harassment in that study had been 52% among women. And I have to say that I was actually looking for some good news. I was looking to say, look, you know, I talk about all these things that seem so hard to remedy, you know, gendered expectations for the, for the division of domestic labor. Um, and so I thought, like, you know, let me offer some good news. Like, we've at least come a long way from the time that 52% of women um, in in faculty positions in academic medicine had experienced sexual harassment. Now, that might say, sound really naive right now, but I might as well tell you, that was what I went in hoping to discover. And the question we asked was, in your professional career, have you encountered unwanted sexual comments, attention, or advances by a superior or colleague? Again, we asked it that way because we wanted to compare to the 1995 data. If we had asked about patients or families of patients, absolutely the number would have been higher. If Mm -hmm. we had asked about a whole battery of behaviors that constitute the iceberg. This is what organizational psychologists favor. You ask about 20 different behaviors rather than asking, have you encountered just a a small list or have you been harassed? Um, the, The percentage would have been even higher. But even with that item, the percentage of women who said yes was 30%. Wow. The, the men, only 4%. And so, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. Yeah, it was better than the 52% that were surveyed back in 1995. But this was a Generation X sample. And it's really appalling that three in 10 of the female junior faculty that we were surveying there um, had been sexually harassed. The surprising thing about the, your study, like, I mean, there's so much to it, but the your sample cohort were these like high achieving ivory tower, um, bright, uh, you know, K awardees, right? They were, they were really. And you're absolutely right. These were the ivory tower, you know, superstars, you know, if anyone were protected because of how strong they were in terms of like getting their K awards, like, I mean, they had to succeed in a very competitive national selection process. And they're probably, you know, pretty well regarded in their divisions or departments. Um, You know, if there was any protection from status, like, and so yeah, 30% is remarkable. When you actually look at the types of harassment they experienced, um, the bulk of the behavior was actually gender harassment, as we discussed. And then There are also data that look at earlier points in the career. So um, in the National Academies report, they actually um, did a study of their own where they found that female medical students um, were 220% more likely than students from non-STEM disciplines and also more likely than any other students from any other STEM disciplines to have experienced sexual harassment by faculty or staff. And there was a meta-analysis of trainees that showed that nearly 60% of trainees had experienced at least one form of harassment or discrimination during training. So there's also more recent studies that are out mostly only in abstract form that are using um, more comprehensive behavioral inventories, like I mentioned. And those suggest that the majority of women are still having these experiences. Wow. Even status post the Me Too movement. Yep. Even after the Me Too movement, um, you know, I, I wonder if even the the Me Too movement might have contributed in some ways um, by making people realize that some of these behaviors um, are, in fact, unwanted. Um, and so I, I do think that was important. 
my next question for you, we sort of touched upon it a little bit, um, was that Dr. Wells co-residents seem to know that Dr. Malfoy has sort of done this before. How does like repeated bad behavior go unreported un- and unremediated un-re- as well? And what type of potential ramifications could there be for Dr. Malfoy? Okay. Um, so this isn't unique to medicine, um, but it probably is worse in medicine, given how much women who are physicians have invested to build their careers. And you alluded to this earlier. Um, and this is something that was emphasized to me by many women who actually wrote to me. They sent me emails. Um, they told me their stories and they said, I mean, some of them even said, I'm surprised I'm sending you this email because you can actually see who I am, but somehow it feels confidential. They said specifically that they didn't formally report um, these experiences, and some of them didn't tell anyone. I mean, there was there was actually one person who told me, I haven't told a single person other than you. Um, and they said they didn't want to be stigmatized um, or marginalized, right? They want to be professionals. They've devoted so much to being recognized as professionals, and especially when the patient is the harasser. You know, we don't want to take away from all that we've done to be physicians to contribute to the health of that patient. And so it's really difficult. And of course, then we talked about the concerns about retaliation as well. Um, And so I told some of their stories in a journal of medicine perspective that I actually think is one of the things I'm most proud of writing ever, mostly because the writing is actually largely me quoting other incredibly eloquent women instead of myself. Um, And these women gave me permission to share their stories. Um, So I I would um, commend sort of reading their stories to get a sense of exactly why this kind of behavior goes unreported. Let's move to case two. Um, This is a case of harassment that is a little bit more insidious. So now Dr. Blackwell is in her second year as an attending, and she recently announced to her division chief that she's six months pregnant. She's learning about maternity benefits. She is hoping to take three or four months for maternity leave. But she started to get comment, comments that make her uncomfortable. For example, her medical education mentor recently said to her, you probably won't be able to keep on target for promotion with small kids at home. She feels uncomfortable about this, but she's not sure if that is harassment. So we put the question to you. Um, I'm not sure whether I'd call it harassment per se, because I actually think her mentor might really mean well here. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's certainly a problematic of gender bias. Um, Her mentor's making a whole bunch of assumptions, and some of them are legitimate assumptions. We do live in a society where there is a gender division of domestic labor. Women often bear the greater burden of domestic responsibilities. Um, We actually, in our K awardee cohort that I keep talking about, um, actually, we found that the women in this incredibly career-oriented cohort of K awardees um, were spending eight and a half hours more per week on parenting and domestic tasks. And that's even after we adjusted for other factors like spousal employment status. So it's a huge difference. Um, but the issue here is that instead of telling her that she won't be able to keep on target, the mentor really should be providing her with resources that the institution provides to mitigate these issues. Um, And what the issues here, they're both the collision of a biological and professional clock because Mm -hmm. only one sex bears children and lactates to my knowledge, right? So there's a, a serious issue there that we have to recognize. And then also the contextual gendered expectations of society. And we do a terrible job of that in medicine. I think you've read some of my studies about how remarkably inadequate our provisions are for parental leave in medical residency training. So we come out and we support policies at the national level saying there should be 12 weeks of paid parental leave. And then within our own field, we don't provide that. Our own training Um, So I think there is a lot that should be done at the institutional level, again, to fix the system so that when the mentor is approached, her response is actually not, um, you won't be able to keep on target for promotion, but instead, congratulations, enjoy this important time in your life. Um, The profession of medicine has come a long way from the day that one couldn't integrate um, work and family. (laughs) Wow. I'm sorry. I'm just so so in awe by your answers. It, it's hard for me to, to get into my ne- into the questions that come afterwards. <laughs> um, so my question about this is: um, How is gender equities related to harassment? 
So, you know, they're actually really linked. And thank you for asking me that question because it's so important. Because as I told you, I initially started studying harassment because I thought it was a potential mechanism that was leading to gender inequity. And I was studying gender inequity more generally. And really, of course, what turns out to be the case is that gender inequity is the environment within which harassment thrives. So when women don't share equally in power and authority, there is more likely to be harassment. So it turns out it is a vicious cycle. Harassment is indeed one of the mechanisms that leads to gender inequity, along with others, like we've talked about, unconscious biases and gendered expectations in society. There's plenty that leads to gender inequity, but sexual harassment is one of those mechanisms that leads to gender inequity. And then gender inequity in turn fosters sexual harassment. So again, it's this vicious cycle. I think that goes back to the, the you know, kind of that meta-analysis that you were pointing to before where um, one of the biggest predictors for um, sexual harassment is the perception of the, that it will be tolerated by the institution. Um, mm-hmm. And then thinking about kind of the percentage of women that are in leadership positions and roles and, um, you know, if the hope is hopefully if we have more women in in uh, directorship roles or in positions of power, that hopefully that this will change the conversation. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, it's harder said than done. And I think particularly for, for me, um, and I think probably a lot of our listeners who are not in an authority position or leadership position, I think we're all probably wondering kind of what is it that we can do? Gender equity, gender harassment are so related. Um, we know, you know, the, the statistic, we said this before in our, in our series that 16% of D or tw- 16 to 20% of deans are women and, you know, statistics go on. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. It briefly went up to 18%, but it's back down to 16% because they opened some new medical schools and the new deans were men. So it's gone back down to 16%. Oh, no. I wanted, yeah. this, I wanted some part of this episode to be hopeful. <laughs> we're going well, down. we'll close with hopeful. We'll close yeah. with hopeful. Okay, sure. okay. But, but so with that being said, you know, what can me as an attending or me as a colleague do for someone? What can a nurse listening or a consultant listening? What, what could we do um, in our everyday Yeah. So I have to tell you that some of the most exciting changes that I have seen are actually coming from your generation. Um, I actually gave this big keynote lecture for our residents association in my little field of radiation oncology. And after it, there was a group of young women who came up to me and said they wanted to form an organization focused on women in radiation oncology. And they were energized by all the statistics they had seen and they wanted to change the world. And I'm going to admit, I'm getting kind of old. I'm not that visionary anymore. I actually will tell you, I tried to talk them out of it. I said, like, maybe they could find what they needed in existing organizations. Maybe I could hook them up with other people. But they eventually convinced me that they actually could be more nimble than existing organizations. And I ended up mentoring them. Um, Actually, it was them mentoring me. I have totally learned more from them um, than they have learned from me. Uh, Talk about the bi-directional nature of mentorship. Um, But we worked together and we did a survey that showed there are actually lots of women who are the only woman within their entire department or one of only two. You know, there might be one other resident or one attending or two attendings, but they feel very isolated. What these young women did is they built this national platform for connecting women who don't have other women in radiation oncology locally to turn to, um, to connect them to women who can then help them navigate gender specific issues. And they also created this great hashtag women who Curie campaign. It's like so cute women who Curie, like Marie Curie. Um, And it's sort of like hashtag. I look like a surgeon. Isn't that clever? It's, it's great. And the idea is to deal with the pipeline issue that our specialty have, because it has only 27% of radiation oncology residents are women, which is absolutely crazy given how awesome our jobs are. Um, But I actually think that women aren't well networked enough in med school to find out about the weird little field of radiation oncology till it's too late. And so mm-hmm. these women have used social media in a really clever way. And they've also created tremendous pressure for our larger professional society to place women on the ballot for leadership. Um, and let's be clear, this is something that I have been writing about for over a decade, right? Nancy, my very first mentor, and I wrote a a, a, an essay about breaking 
through time to break through the glass ceiling in radiation oncology. That was in 2006. And last year, not a single woman was elected to the board of the big radiation oncology specialty society, ASTRO. We had mm -hmm. written about this in 2006 when we saw this, that women weren't being represented um, as we had expected on the ASTRO board. And here it was, 2018, and not a single woman was elected. Well, guess what? Not only did these young women end up writing an editorial with me again, which made me roll my eyes and say, I wrote this editorial, didn't really have any impact. They said, we know how to make an impact. <laughs> they created a clever social media campaign. And one clever social media campaign later, the National Specialty Society is actually running a woman against another woman for president of our society and also a woman against another woman for secretary treasurer. So there is an wow. awful lot that you can do by leading from the middle and from the grassroots. So I would encourage your listeners to, to step up. You guys have the energy and the ideas and there really is the potential to yeah. have dramatic influence. I think I think even for 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 me, I just want to plug how much uh, for example Twitter has made an impact on me and that I think when I was uh, years ago when I was training, I like if a patient masturbated in front of me or if some innuendo was said and I was like, "Wait, that was a little weird." And maybe in 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 the moment I might just freeze. Uh, that's a kind of often my my micro micro trauma micro freeze moment, but honestly after joining social media and and being in this women in medicine Twitter chats and just um, finding each other, right? Like really networking. And I, I, I've known, noticed such a change in myself in that when, you know, the next time, you know, whether it's from a patient or, or even if something's happening to someone on my team, um, I just... I'm so much more likely to, st to stand up or, or to, you know, I might not have the right thing to say, uh, but having these open communications, even like checking in with that person afterwards. And um, yeah, I just want to reiterate the the power of, of kind of, of the technology nowadays. And I hope we can continue to be creative um, with it. The one other creative thing I- um, Can I just, can, can I yes. just add one? Can I add one thing to just follow on that point? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think the one thing that we didn't really cover in our prior conversation, but that really relates here, um, is that um, identity as sex intersects with a number of other identities, race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity. And women who are inhabiting multiple minority identities are likely to have um, different experiences and different needs. And so that power of social media to create communities may be particularly important for those groups, but I don't want this episode to go on without us having acknowledged the even bigger hurdles that might be from certain groups and the power of social media potentially to, to help there. Yeah, thank you for making that point um, because I don't want that to get lost and I hope in future episodes we can talk even more about that uh, and that would be excellent. Yeah, I hope, um, I hope, you'll, I hope mm -hmm. you'll actually focus a whole Mm -hmm. focus actually a whole future episode on that because it yeah. it merits its own um, focused discussion. It shouldn't be an mm -hmm. afterthought the way it's sort of come across here. Agreed. Yeah. Um, maybe, Shreya, what do you think? Should we skip the last question and talk about take-home points? Or um, Reshma, is there any other question that you would like us to ask you or any other Actually, points? Before I, I do like the the last question. If Reshma, you're not you're not uh, running rush rushing, um, but I do want to ask: Is there anything else from an institutional perspective that can be done? Because I think the biggest thing I learned from you is that you know, again, Leah and I were t were saying we thought this whole episode would be about how do we react when a patient does this or when an attending does this to you or when a supervisor director and you know I think you really opened our eyes to the system um, perspectives and so are there like p creative ideas that other institutions are doing people who are doing it well um, just yeah I would I would love s some more uh, yeah are there any more things that um, that people can be inspired by Absolutely. So there are a number of places that are doing really creative things. And to achieve cultural transformation, we really need interventions. So there are a number of leading um, institutions that have developed multifaceted interventions. One of them is the University of Pennsylvania that has uh, actually published on a trial that they led on transformation 
transforming academic culture. Um, there are other institutions that have developed resources that are readily available online. So for example, my own institution, the University of Michigan's Advance Program has a committee called STRIDE. And STRIDE actually has tactics for recruiting and advancing um, diverse populations. You know, it, it starts with how you structure the job posting itself, um, the criteria that uh, individuals are evaluated on, um, the behavioral interviewing techniques that you should be using, um, the policies that place at your institution to promote work-life integration. Again, we talked quite a bit about how um, there are differential challenges for women and men. And so if we want equity at the highest levels and throughout our organization, we have to address unconscious biases and these gendered expectations of society in addition to addressing the overt forms of sexual harassment. And again, um, there's so many creative interventions out there, but I'll just mention a couple more. Um, Stanford just published on their uh, pilot study that looked at rewarding thankless service tasks that often fall to women, you know, mm -hmm. would you just review this grant? Would you just be on this committee that's actually not an important committee, but it's, you know, it's vital to the functioning of our institution, but it's not a visible committee? Or would you, you know, please mentor this person or do this or do that? Um, Stanford actually decided to recognize service and uh, assign credits for service that then could be utilized creatively either to support resources needed in the workplace. So if you needed grant writing support, you could say, hey, I did this and I have that credit. And so I want to redeem my credit for a grant writing support. Um, or oh, I love that idea. You could get home food delivered if that was your need. And so you could actually redeem those credits for what it was that you specifically needed. So lots of really, really cool programs. And then my very favorite, which I will close with, um, is a program that was actually um, initially conceived by Nancy Tarbell, the person that I started this whole podcast talking about. When she was director of, of the Office of Women's Careers, she ran something called the Claflin Distinguished Scholars Program, which still exists at MGH. And it recognized that women who have the responsibility of caring for um, young children were facing a particular period of vulnerability to falling off the academic ladder, right? They were falling off the ladder right after they had young kids that they had to take care of. And the idea of giving them a small grant, 30000 a year for two years, it became 50000 a year for two years, small amounts of money to get helping hands within the workplace, you know, a postdoc who could run the lab a couple of years while they were facing that remarkable extra professional caregiving demand. And we wrote about that together. And actually, the funders at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation read that and were inspired by that and created their own program that they've actually now got 10 different medical schools implementing a, a different version, but inspired by that program of something called the Fund to Retain Clinician Scientists that actually recognizes that when individuals face substantial extra professional caregiving demands, rather than simply forcing them out the door, we should do is try to support them and keep them in the fold because the because the rewards that it brings to academic medicine, the the collective intelligence that is improved by the diversity of having their perspectives retained is immeasurable. And just as one last piece of evidence on that, when we looked at the Claflin scholars and we evaluated what they had gone on to do, we looked at Claflin scholars between 97 and 2003. And we surveyed them. And of the 32, 31 responded. And those 31 individuals had brought in $51 million in grants on grants on which they were PI. That's direct funding only. And the whole program had cost Mass General $2.1 million. A pretty good return on investment. Wow. And you can argue that those women would have succeeded anyway. But that was not the history of what, what was happening to women at that point in their careers at MGA. Yeah. Women are worth the ROI. <laughs> no, I'm so happy I asked this question. I'm so, so happy. Um, the other one other thing I wanted to plug, I I was, you know, as I do usually is stock our our guests, uh, like I did with the last episode that was released. I was listening to one of your interviews and you also talked about um another creative idea, which and I don't know if this has been implemented, but I don't want to plug it for anyone who's listening, like looking for ideas to make a change at their institution. But you had talked about an anon like po the possibility of what would it look like if an organization had an anonymous like chat or forum or platform where people can uh, sub 
submit uh, possible uh, questions of, you know, sexual harassment or possible uh, actions that they've seen happen or have happened to them. And it's an anonymous place where there isn't as much of a worry of retaliation. Um, I thought that was a good idea. I don't know. Has that been implemented anywhere? So there are many medical schools that are now trying to um, use this in confidential ways to understand the mistreatment of their students and their trainees and their faculty uh, by providing these safe spaces to talk about both exemplars of professionalism and instances in which expectations for professionalism were not met. And not doing that just in identifiable I was mentored by this person and in my evaluation of that person, which will be relatively identifiable because I'm one of only four students who rotated with this person at this time, um, is submitted instead um, in an, I might have observed this or this might have happened, you know, um, in public. It it is harder when things happen behind closed doors to be able to disclose those without um, becoming identifiable. But I do think that they are a piece of the system that can be used to identify serial transgressors. The so I I wanted to ask you. There's a editorial from the New York Times um, this last weekend that's sort of storming uh, medical Twitter uh, by Daniel Offrey that's titled The Business of Healthcare Depends on Exploiting Doctors and Nurses. And I think the way this relates is that a lot of physician jobs feel unsustainable for men and women, for mm-hmm. parents and people who are not parents. And I, we, you already mentioned that a lot of these women who are pursuing academic careers, K, have K awards, want to get an R01. They're actually doing more of the caregiving at home. Um, and the jobs are unsustainable for them and and for men as well. And sometimes I, you know, I have said to Shreya, sometimes these jobs feel structured for male physicians from a bygone era with a stay-at-home wife. Mm-hmm. And we all, you know, what this editorial says basically is that these jobs are unsustainable for all of us. Do you have suggestions so for us so that equity doesn't just mean that we're doing what these men were doing when they had this caregiving mm-hmm. help and maybe we can all do a little bit less of this work um, and make our lives more sustainable? And I actually think that is one of the one of the great um, benefits that can come from integrating more women at every level of the organization is that we come with a different perspective and we ask questions just like that. Why does it have to be the way it's always been? Um, we absolutely need to evolve as a profession to address the unrealistic expectations that are leading to the epidemic of burnout and suicide that is hurting you know, not only physicians, um, but the patients and society we serve. Um, this is not the best approach to getting maximal value out of the human capital that's here, Mm -hmm. right? And so we absolutely need to leverage creative ways to use technology to actually make our lives better rather than worse. I won't use the word epic, but you know, mm-hmm. we need to figure out ways that we can harness the flexibility that technology allows um, and to stop doing things the same way we've always done them. Stop focusing on rote and routine tasks, rely on technology to take some of those over so that we can do medicine smarter and better. Thank you so much. I love that I think- answer. We have, we're, we're all inspired. Do you have any, um, could you maybe give us a few take home points from, from our talk today? And then if you have any social media or projects that you'd like to plug so that we can, we can all know where to find you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the key take home points here are, um, that sexual harassment is a problem that has to be addressed at the systems level by organizations. Um, that doesn't mean that individuals are not required to do something. Um, we are all citizens of this profession and citizens of this society, and we absolutely have a duty to step up and create policies, disseminate policies, and enforce policies that will not allow sexual harassment to occur. We need to recognize that an environment of inequity is actually what causes sexual harassment to thrive. And so we must attack not only sexual harassment itself directly, but also 
aim to ensure that we promote more women, um, integrate more women into every level of organizations so that we end up with this structurally egalitarian workplace where men and women are equally sharing in power and authority. That's actually a quote of somebody way smarter than me. Um, it, I think it's said so beautifully that we need to integrate women at every level. So, um, that would be my takeaways. Um, and then social media wise, again, I just entered Twitter on Monday for real. So, uh, I don't even necessarily know my Twitter can, handle, but I can be your social media <laughs> consultant. I will let me let me Google Google I, you right. I now. got it. Go it's for it. at at R E S H M A J A G S I. So it's pretty much your name. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Dr. Jackson, this was excellent. Um, I'm hopeful for the future. I'm hopeful this episode will make an impact that um, you, your research, your team, you know, the people that you mentor is, are going to continue to make an impact. And um, yeah, let's let's continue this conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for including me. Of course. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being with us. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yum. <laughs> Thank you, the witch. Uh, you, can find, you can find show notes along with links to any articles, books, websites, apps mentioned on the show at thecurbsiders.com backslash podcast. You can also sign up and to receive our weekly mailing list with a PDF copy of our expertly done show notes at thecurbsiders.com backslash knowledge food. We are committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your input. So subscribe, rate, review our show on iTunes. Send us an email at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. You can recommend a future topic or tell us if you love or what you hate about the show. And finally, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Curbsiders. Thanks to all of our producers for this episode. Hannah Abrams, Nora Toronto, Molly Hubline, Beth Garbatelli, Sarah Phoebe Roberts, and to our whole Curbsiders team who helps keep the show running. Hannah R. Abrams runs our Twitter. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is on Instagram. And Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. Until next time, I'm Dr. Shreya Trivedi. I'm Dr. Leah Witt. And I'm Chris the Chew Man Chew. Good night. Good night. Good morning. It could be somebody's morning. Good point. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>